<laughs> Welcome everyone to Landing Place Church, where we're continuing our series, Connect Four. And the only thing missing is, is you. If you're new to Landing Place Church, you can text NEW to the number below. And if you're here in person with us today, you can go out to the lobby and visit Connection Central for your gift. And if you're visiting us online, we'll have a link for you too and you'll get a gift. And also, if you're wondering what's going on, we have a website you can go to and you can check out the top three. So what, do, uh, what are we expecting today, Joe? Well, Tony, today we're going to worship through music. Pastor Mark is going to give us a great message about how we were created to serve. And there's going to be a time for generosity. All right. And how do you give? Well, if you text landing place to the number below here, or on the way out, you can drop it off in the basket. Now, let's, let's get, stand, up stand up and, and worship. worship. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you today. Come on and stand with us. Father, we thank you this morning for your presence in this place. Thank you for your spirit, Holy Spirit. We love you. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory.
morning.
will Hey! Oh no, the God of breakthroughs on He's on your side Oh, with all creation Oh, we praise you Oh, come on and just lift your hands and sing We praise you morning we praise you oh, we pray Jesus we praise you in this place today because you are greater than the darkness you and you alone have the victory we look to you we lift our voices we lift our hands in faith today because we know that our praise activates faith and some of us may be going through a battle in our life right now. And so Father, we declare the truth of this next song over our battle, over our circumstance. And I pray God that you would release something in this room today. Increase our faith. We look to you. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Do you believe it? Come on. Oh, my God will never fail. Let me hear your voices. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on, just your voices. I'm going to see. Why? For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yeah. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. 
God, you are greater than the battle that is facing us right now. Many people in this room today are facing an impossible giant. It may be a medical diagnosis. It may be a family member has fallen away. And whatever it is, God, I believe that you want to do a mighty thing that will increase our faith today. I believe that you want to work in every single heart and you want to show off your power and your glory. And so we welcome you, Lord God. Come and do what only you can do. Come and move in our hearts and our lives. Show us anything that is, that is a block for us growing in our faith. God, your desire is to be connected with your people since the Garden of Eden, that has been your heart. And so, Father, we press into you. We want to connect with you in a deeper way. And so we look to you. We give you praise. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we declare the truth of who you are, no matter what, even if we don't feel it or see you working in our lives, we believe that you are doing it. And if we have not seen breakthrough, we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so God, we press into you today and we cry out to you. The victory, the battle belongs to Jesus Christ. The darkness must back away. The enemy must flee at the name of Jesus. And so we lift you up in this place. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. We praise you for you are worthy. And you win in the end. We know the end of the story. And you take ashes and you make it into something beautiful. You are victorious. We declare all of this in the precious, mighty, victorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, church. Why don't you turn and say hi to somebody and give them a high five. Good morning once again. I want to welcome you back to Landing Place Church. It's great to have you here. Whether you're here live or you're joining us online, we're in the middle of a series called Connect Four. We've been talking about connection, how to find that connection that we're looking for. 14 years ago, there was an invention that has changed every single one of our lives, particularly how we connect. 14 years ago, Apple released the iPhone. Since then, lots of different smartphones have come along. 14 years ago, no one had one of these in their pocket. Purely out of curiosity today, just flip your hand up if you got one of these on you, any sort of mobile device. Virtually 100% for those of you online. That's a pretty amazing thing to think that somebody invented something 14 years ago that none of us had. 14 years later, almost every single one of us 
has. I mean, that, that in itself is pretty amazing. But what's really amazing is the ability to connect with this. It has transformed how we connect with other people. And in some ways, that's a great thing. We can FaceTime with somebody across the world in real time, and that is really, really cool. We can access really important information like who's singing the song on the radio. At the, just a touch of a couple strokes of a finger. We can keep up with people on social media. There's so many good things about connection that this has allowed us to do. But one of the unanticipated consequences of this, and I don't think anybody really thought about this, and it just sort of happened, is that as we broadened our connections to the point where we can connect with anybody and everybody, the actual depth of our face-to-face -face interactions with people around us have decreased dramatically. So we've added a lot of new connections, but our current connections tend to be much shallower than they used to be. You ever check your screen time? Phew. It's a little, don't you wonder what you were doing for two or three hours a day? or more 14 years ago? Like, how are you spending that time that we're on the screen now? It's a really good question. You were probably spending more time actually connecting with real people face to face than you were electronically. And what's happened is we sort of lost the ability to actually connect with people in a meaningful way. And what's happened is as a result, and I'm not dissing technology, man, I am a fan of technology, but an unintended consequence of opening up our connections broader has left us more lonely and feeling more disconnected than we've ever felt before. And that's a problem. So this series, we've been talking about finding that connection that we're looking for. We've been talking about four ways to connect. And we've learned that connection is one phase of a sort of a four-phase process. And it happens in our connection. It happens in our spiritual journey. But it really was actually happens with our bodies and our physical journey because we all go through that. So I want to walk through some phases with you, a little bit of review. Uh, 16 years ago this week, we had a baby at our house, and uh, she looked something like this. In fact, she looked exactly like that. Um, 16 years ago, and if there was a word that I would attach to a baby in this particular phase of life, it would be consume. How many of you know babies consume, right? They consume milk, and they consume diapers, and they consume wipes, and they consume time, they consume money, they consume your sleep. If you're in this phase, you know this is a consume phase. It's like they can't do anything for themselves. <laughs> now, none of us look at a baby, at least in a more rational moment, and go, man, you need to step it up. You need to get with the program. Now, you may say that. But we understand that in the beginning of the journey, the first phase is really just to consume. And we're all sort of okay with that, as, as exhausting as it is, because we know that our baby's not going to stay in that phase forever. Isn't that great? They're going to move on to the next phase. And I think for us, I felt like the next phase for my kids were the first day of kindergarten, that first day of school. Anybody send kids to school this past week or two? Yeah. I'm really impressed with some of you. I watch social media, and some of you, man, you got the signs with, like, the teacher's name and what grade they're going into. We just never quite, we were so lucky to get our kids together just to, like, okay, we're going to get a picture before you go. All right, first day of school. You know, what happens when they, when they move from this consume mode to this connect mode, I would call it? They begin to connect with people other than you as parents. They begin to connect with teachers. They begin to connect with coaches. They begin to connect with peers. They spend the next 12 to who knows how many years in deep connection learning, picking up new things. Now, make no mistake, they're still consuming. But they're not consuming as much. And they're starting to connect more. None of these phases start and stop on one day. They all sort of overlap. Now, I've been told, but I have not experienced it yet, that someday your kids may actually get out of school and move on to the next phase. My daughter graduated, the oldest one here, uh, graduated from college last year, uh, and uh, she's not done with school. Uh, she is going on to get her master's, but she's in biomedical engineering, and the closest I see to the next phase, I can see the next phase, we're just not quite there yet. Uh, last year, her group had a senior project, and so their project was to create a tourniquet 
for severed limbs, very unique niche market that you can use out in the military field and out in the, the emergency medical services field where you slap this tourniquet on a, a damaged limb and it measures the blood pressure both above the cut and below the cut and it self-adjusts the tourniquet so that pretty much anybody could put this thing on and save a limb. Feels like we're starting to move from connection to contribution. It's a great thing to get to that far where, where you start to see the payoff for the connections. You start to see a payoff for the education because it's never the goal of any parent to have their kid remain in school forever, is it? <laughs> Don't you hope someday that ends? Don't you hope someday they move out? Don't you hope someday they actually stop consuming your stuff and you actually get to start consuming their stuff? I mean, isn't that, the, I don't, isn't that kind of the goal of all parenting at some point in time? Like I said, we haven't fully recognized it, but we know this in the human development. We have all experienced this. We've, we've all been in one of these phases, and we know that each phase is important, and there's not a bad phase, but it's always bad if we get stuck in a phase. If we're stuck in the consume phase for the rest of our life, oh, that's going to be really exhausting. If we stay in the connect phase, all that knowledge goes to waste. We really want to move on to that contribute phase. How do we get there? Well, the same phase system is true in our spiritual journey as well. We all start our spiritual journey, wherever we're at, as consumers. We need what God has to offer, what God's people have to offer. When we come in, some of them are broken and hurting and just need to receive. They need to be loved like a baby. They need to be cared for like a child. They just need someone to wrap their arms around them and take care of them and love them. And that is perfectly appropriate place to start all of our spiritual journey. That's a great place. For a season, we need to be there. Last week, we talked about moving from consume because we're never created just to consume. We're also created to connect. We talked about connecting last week into different groups, into different groups of people and how to get connected. And a bunch of you signed up to be in either care groups or small groups uh, or mid-sized groups. Great place to take that next step of learning, growing, beautiful. From a church standpoint, it would be easy to think that's the end. The ultimate goal of church is to get you connected with people and to grow, and, and that's fantastic, like it's a means to an end. But it's actually not where the journey ends. God really wants us to move to the next phase of life too, and that's contribute. For three years, Jesus connected with 12 guys. He ministered to a lot of people, but he was in a small group. For three years, he poured his life into these guys. We're going to pick up a story today. It's the last day that Jesus is on earth before his crucifixion. Actually, the last night before. And he's about to have a conversation with his followers, his closest guys, his 12, to say, hey guys, you've spent a lot of time consuming these three years, and we've spent a lot of time connecting these past three years. It's time to introduce you to the next phase. I'm going to go away. And I need you to move from connect to contribute. What does that look like? Jesus puts on a clinic the last night of his life in challenging his followers to take the next step in their journey. We're going to see what we can learn from that today. So we are going to be in John 13. If you've got a U version, if you've got a Bible, you can open it up. Uh, we've got a nice chunk here. Uh, let me set up the scene just a little bit. There's a week-long festival going on in the city of Jerusalem where they find themselves. There were three big party weeks every year. Most of you don't like to think about the Bible in that sense, but that's really what it was. God says, look, y'all need some breaks, and I want you to get together. I want you to eat and drink and have fun. I know. It seems crazy, right? Yeah. If you grew up in church, you're like, oh, I don't know. That doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> it's in there. But there were very specific things that they celebrated, and one of them was called Passover. And this particular celebration happened every year. And if you were a Jewish person and you lived outside of Jerusalem, you'd actually come back to the city for that event. And Jesus lived outside the city. Jesus actually lived about 10 days away. He lived most of his time up in the Sea of Galilee. So three times a year, they would make the trek down to Jerusalem for the week-long celebration and make the trek back. 
three times a year. This is Passover. This is celebrating something that happened 1,400 years earlier when the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt. And you may, if you grew up in church at all or even watched movies, there was Moses and the whole ten plagues of leaving Egypt and the Red Sea. Well, the last plague was the angel of death was going to come through Egypt, kill the firstborn male and the firstborn animal in every single household. In order to spare the Jewish people, God said, I want you to sacrifice a lamb tonight. I want you to eat the whole thing as a family. I want you to take a little bit of the blood and put it on the doorpost of your house because as the angel of death comes through, he's going to pass over the houses that have the blood on the doorpost. You're going to be saved by the blood of the lamb. Every year thereafter, God said, I want you to celebrate this amazing deliverance that you experienced with a week-long festival. That's where we're at when we pick up the story. All right, uh, we are in John 13. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples on his ministry here on earth, and now he loved them right up to the very end. Now it's time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, who was one of the twelve, son of Simon Iscariot, we now call him Judas Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he'd come from God, and that he's going to return to God. So he got up, took off his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Skip down to verse 12. After washing their feet, putting on his robe, he sat down again, and he asked this, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You ought to wash each other's feet. I have given this to you as an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. With all authority, one of the very last things that Jesus did for these 12 followers who are connected together, he said, I want to show you how to move from connect to contribute in your journey. How do we move from connecting to actually contributing? Two things that I think Jesus outlines for us that are crystal clear that were applicable to his day and applicable to us today. The first was this. If we really want to move from connect to contribute, we have to love like Jesus loved. you got to love like Jesus loved. The verse we go back, it says this. He loved the disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Now, you may think, well, these were incredibly lovable guys. I'm sure they were easy to love. No, they weren't. They were a hot mess. They didn't agree with each other. They argued with each other. They argued with Jesus. They didn't believe in him about half the time, even when he did incredibly miraculous things. They argued amongst themselves who was going to be the greatest. I mean, these guys were not that lovable. As soon as this meal's over, Judas is going to leave and sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Within 12 hours, Peter is going to deny that he even knows who Jesus is. They're not that lovable. And yet Jesus loved them anyway. It's easy to love lovable people, isn't it? We have a friend named Jesse. We love Jesse. Everyone loves Jesse. Jesse is nice. She's kind. She smiles at people. She hugs people. She's great. We say at our house, if you don't like Jesse, that's a problem with you. (laughs) Because she's lovable. It's easy to love lovable people. But how many of you have somebody in your life who's not as lovable? You got that coworker or boss, you just, mm, a classmate who picks on you. You got somebody in your life that's just unlovable. Jesus went out of his way to love people that everybody else hated. Jesus went out of his way to love people everybody else hated. When all the religious people said, ooh, we don't want to be around those people, they they would even ask him, why do you hang around such scummy people? And Jesus goes, I didn't come to love 
the lovable. I came to love the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the people that everyone else rejected. It's easy to love lovable people. It's really hard to love people who are hard to love. Some people come and ask me, Mark, how do I know if I'm really growing in my spiritual walk? How do I know if I'm really becoming more like Jesus? How do I know if my life is being transformed? I'll say, well, tell me about some of the things you're doing. And oftentimes, they'll kind of recite what we call our growth path. Well, I'm spending more God time. I'm praying more. I'm reading the Word more. That's great. Hey, I'm in a group now. I'm getting connected. I'm showing up on weekend services. Man, that's great. I'm starting to give in generosity time. I'm starting to do some go time activities. Like, that is all really good stuff. Tell me how you're doing with loving people. Because at the end of the day, I think that's more of a sign of maturity than anything else. Because we can do all sorts of that kind of stuff, which are really good, and I think they help us get there. But the truth is, until we start loving people like Jesus loved people, we haven't arrived. And let's be honest, none of us have arrived. There's always somebody out there that Jesus says, we need to love them. If you skip down in the chapter just a little bit, a few more verses down to 34, he said, hey guys, now I'm going to give you a new commandment. What I love is what follows is not a new commandment. <laughs> you ever see something, a product that says new and improved? It's not new and improved. <laughs> They're just trying to capture your attention. Hey, there's something new and improved. This must be better. Actually, Jesus says something he said over and over again. Let me give you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, how does Jesus love us? Completely unconditionally. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world you're my disciples. Jesus goes, how should church people be known? How should church people be known outside of this t- context of church? We should be the ones who are loving people. Now, let's just be really gut level honest. Has the church always been good at this? No. We don't even love our own sometimes. We shoot our wounded sometimes. This is a challenge from Jesus to say, look, We should look differently than the world looks. When when the world is hating each other, when the world is at odds with one another, when the world can't agree on what needs to be done, we should be the people coming in and going, you know what? We may not agree on things. We may not look the same. We might not be from the same background. We may not vote the same. I can still love you in spite of all of that. That's a big deal. How do I know if I'm moving along in the journey. How do I know if I'm graduating and to contribute? I will tell you, it will start by loving each other. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus does more than just talk. He puts his words into actions, and I love this. He says, look, you want to move from connect to contribute, love like Jesus. The second is to serve like Jesus. To serve like Jesus. Let me set up the context just a little bit. They've gathered in the upper room, When I was in Israel uh, recently, uh, this is the replica of what they believe an upper room would have looked like. It's obviously not the original upper room. They do believe it is, however, in the site that the original upper room was. An aha moment for me. I don't know why I didn't really put this together, but I haven't really put it all together, which shows you I've got a long ways to go. A lot of things happen in this room. The Last Supper happened in this room. Jesus showed up twice after he was resurrected while they were in this room. And on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out in this room. There's a lot of action in this room. Now, as they were showing up for the Passover meal, normally, because you would recline when you eat, normally there would be a servant boy there to wash your feet. Because your feet is going to be dangerously close to someone else's face. And as you're tromping along in your sandals and dirt and dust and animal dung. Nobody's really cool eating right next to that. So typically there'd be a service, our, our servant boy, you would walk in, you'd take your sandals off, he would wash your feet, and then you would go ahead and you'd recline and you'd eat and you'd just enjoy. Well, that night nobody showed up. Now you would think after, after three years of following Jesus, like one of the disciples would have stepped up and go, like even if they voted on it and go, hey, which one of us is the least? Who was the disciple that didn't get any press? Who's, whose name did not make it in other than saying, oh, these are the 12, but you never hear from them again? Like, that one should be washing some feet, right? <laughs> not even that one stepped up and washed feet. Nobody even thought to, which I'm sure had to be super discouraging for Jesus. Think how disappointed you would be a little bit as Jesus going, come on, guys. 
So what does Jesus do? He takes off his robe, gets down, pours water into a basin, and he goes around one by one and he washes their feet. That was a practical thing that needed to be done. In order for them to enjoy the meal, it needed to be done. So it served a, a practical purpose. But then when he's done, he goes, oh, no, we're not done. We're not done. And since I, the Lord, your Lord and your teacher have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've done this as an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Jesus goes, look, this is more than about foot washing. Yes, you need your feet cleaned. But the truth is, it's time for you guys to move from connect to contribute. It's time for you guys to go to the next level in your spiritual journey. It's time for you to go on from just receiving to actually contributing and giving. It's time for a shift. Do as I've done. How many of you ever had a post-church analysis on the way home? You know what I mean by that? Yeah, you know, I got a potato burrito instead of a bacon. I think they're out of bacon. Um, the second song, I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't really connect with it at all. That third point in the message, I really wasn't sure about that either. There is no third point in the message, just so you know. <laughs> protecting myself. I don't know why. I grew up in church. We had, we had a post-church analysis every week on the way home. It was about a 15-minute ride home. We would talk about what happened and how it hit us and what we received and how we liked it, the things that we liked and the things we didn't like. And you know what that is? That's consume. We live in a very consumeristic world. You go into a restaurant and you're consuming from the minute you sit down to the minute you leave. You're analyzing. You're saying, ooh, I like that. We had really good service. We had really good food. Eh, this was a little cold. We could have done some. We're trained to be consumers. Our world has trained us to be consumers. When you walk in, you want a warm greeting. You want a hot cup of coffee. You want to check your kids into kids and have them have a fabulous, fun, and informative time. You want to walk in and hear amazing music played by talented musicians. You want a message that's engaging and relevant to your life. I get it. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But if we come into a place like this thinking, what do I get out of it? We're still in the consume mode. It's just a reality check. What would happen if we actually started showing up at church with the mindset of, I don't come to receive anything here today. I'm coming here today just because I have something to give. I almost guarantee you there's somebody sitting here who needs something you have today. They need a smile. They need a handshake. They need a high five. They need a hug. Maybe they're the one who need the warm greeting. Maybe they're the one who need a hot cup of coffee. Maybe they're the one who needs somebody to watch their kids. Maybe they're, you get it. What would happen if we entered this place thinking what I could contribute instead of what I could consume? I'll tell you, that's a mindset that will change your journey. When we walk in here thinking, or maybe not walk in here. You know, sometimes I come into church, but I don't know if I, I really get much out of it. Maybe that wasn't the intention. <laughs> maybe the intention was somebody was sitting down the row from you who really needed something you had to offer, and sometimes it's not complicated and it's not a lot. Jesus started by serving his church family first, and I think that's an important thing. He said, look, if we can't get this right in this context, <laughs> don't you dare export anything out of this building. <laughs> please, <coughs> please don't. Let's get it right here first. Let's learn to serve one another well here first so that as we leave this building, because contribute is not the last phase. Pastor Roger is going to talk next week about the next phase. There's another phase, and that's serving people outside of the church building. But we got to get it right inside first. Two people that have done this really, really well are Ed and Brandy. Ed and Brandy came here a number of years ago, and and they kind of went through the phases. They were in a receiving phase for a while and then a connecting phase. And then they sort of went in this contribute mode and they serve out at uh, the welcome team. And I want you to hear just a little bit of their story about just when you start to think that you're actually contributing, <laughs> God has this way of blessing you back. Let's take a listen. Hello, I'm Brandy Dale. And I'm Ed Dale. And we've been coming to Landing Place Church for the past five years now. So serving here at Landing Place has deepened my relationship with 
God and just giving me more God time. Um, I, I am a quiet um, God worshiper and um, not one who necessarily is the one to be praying out loud in the, in the groups. Um, but I, I spend my time with God through serving. So doing that God time, um, coming here to be able to serve is how I spend my time. So serving at Landing Place has really strengthened my relationship with God. And I think I can really pinpoint it to uh, working on the uh, new here team. I had a young family come in a couple months ago now. Uh, and, and part of my routine uh, is when I try to get to know them and I'm giving them the tour, they, I always ask them why you're here or, or how did you find us? And the lady said that her five-year-old son wanted to learn about God and have a relationship with God. Um, and I, as somebody who's on the team, uh, and I understand that I'm just a small part of this kid's story and his relationship with God, it's cool to be a part of that. So my motivation to serve um, is this church, this family, um, and God. I just feel like I have a deeper relationship with him now through this family here at LPC. Um, we have found a wonderful place to celebrate God, and I want to be here to serve whenever I can. So that's why I'm here. So I guess to sum it all up, it my motivation uh, for serving is God wants me to serve. Uh, and if God wants me to serve, I'm gonna serve. So the question today is, what phase am I in? It's a really good question to ask. And again, there's, there's no wrong answer. There's no bad phase to be in. It's just good to know, hey, I'm in consume mode right now. I, I just need to be poured into and I got some hurts I'm working through and I just need to be surrounded and loved by people and, and, and I, I need, I'm in that phase right now. And you know what? That's okay. Like a baby, we don't condemn or look down on that. There's a phase where we, and we all started there, where we need to be in that phase. Some of you, particularly last week as we talked, said, ooh, you know what? I've been in that phase, but the truth is, I think I'm probably ready to, to go to the next step. And so many of you, we have a connection fair last week, a groups fair, and like dozens of people connected in groups last week and said, you know what, I need to take a step and jump in to the next phase, and that's connect for me. And that's really cool. Some of you are in the connect phase right now. But honestly, as we go along, there's some of you that have been in the connect phase for a long time. And you've been connected, you've been in groups, you've been, you've been growing, you've been, you're that student who's, who's ready to take the next step, and what is that? And I think our job as a church is to provide you with opportunities to say, hey, if I'm in Connect and I want to go to Contribute, how do I do that? Where do I do that? What's the process? I think that's our job, is to make it really clear, to make it really easy, and Pastor Roger's going to come up and give you some really clear instructions about how you can move to the next phase. Whatever phase you're in, embrace it. Embrace it, but always remember this is a journey, and Jesus always wants us to become more like him. He wants us to love like him, and he wants us to serve like him. And serving is more than just joining a team. It's more than just connecting. It's an attitude. It's a posture. It's a lifestyle. Jesus looked at how he could serve others, but he started here, and then next week we're going to talk about how to take it outside of these four walls. Because ultimately, at least in this spiritual journey, the journey's not over until we actually reproduce and bring people back in who consume. That's where the journey actually goes from here. So, I want to stop there for today, to be continued next week. But I will tell you the most important connection that you'll ever make is a connection with God. It's where all of this sort of starts. And for some of you today, you're connected to God and you've been connected to God. But honestly, for some of you here, you're just kind of checking this thing out. You're checking this whole God thing out. Is there anything here? Does this make sense to me at all? It's a great question to ask. And this is a safe place to ask questions like that. God makes it really clear that we got disconnected from him when sin entered the world. We all mess up. I mess up. Our staff messes up. You mess up. We're all in good company here. We've all messed up. 
God said our sin separates us from God. It breaks the connection down. That's why Jesus, a few hours after our story today, went to the cross. He paid a debt that we owed to break the power of sin so that we could get reconnected to God. If you've never done that, if you've never said, ooh, I didn't even know that was a thing, you have an opportunity this morning to actually receive the gift of forgiveness, to reconnect to God, to start this entire journey that we're talking about. It's really the next step for some of you today. And I want to help just lead you in that in a simple prayer as we close our eyes, bow our heads. God, we thank you for the truth of your word. God, we are so grateful that even though we are disconnected from you, that you provided a way to get reconnected. Right now, we just acknowledge and believe that Jesus came to this earth and he, he died a death that he didn't deserve, that we actually did deserve. And he offers us this amazing exchange that we get off free. And he pays for what he didn't, a debt he didn't rack up. God, we thank you for this amazing offer. We want to receive that today. We want to receive your forgiveness. We want a fresh start and a clean slate. And God, more than anything, we want to be connected to you, the God of the universe. God, will you help us begin this journey together as we, we just take little steps toward you? And God, we love you and we thank you so much. God, will you help each one of us continue to grow more like you, to love people, and to serve people like Jesus did. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.